Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Hannah Snellgrove and I sail on Ilka 6 for the British sailing team. Yeah, I'm Joe Clark. I am the Olympic champion from Rio 2016. I'm Joe Fraser, Team GB gymnast. Hey, my name's Emma Wilson. Uh, I'm a windsurfer. Uh, I'm really happy to be selected for Team GB for Paris 2024. This is Anything But Footy, a Olympic and Paralympic podcast covering the games all the time rather than once every three weeks. I'm Michael. And I'm John. And two more British boxers put their place in Paris this summer. Coming up, we'll round up the very latest from the first Olympic qualifiers and who has secured their ticket on the Eurostar and is en route to Paris this year. Paris organisers reveal some more opening ceremony details as they get a final thumbs up from the IOC. About 140 days to go before the Great British men will start the whole of the men's hockey tournament on day one of the game. We go the And as well as our news from the games, we'll hear from two of our favourite athletes. One, we already know, will be the Paris. Another, we still has to qualify. Being able to spend as much time as possible at the end of the venue and when the court is the massive part of the game. Like, I'll take the last one and watch one minute before we get there. So I have a bit of a day mixing in it. So eyes on Paris. I've been catching up with slalom canoeist Mallory Franklin and athlete Gemma Riki. Do stay in touch, see what we're all about. You can always visit us online, anythingbutfooty.com. You can find us on social media. We're on all the platforms and we always love to hear from you as well, whether that's on social media or through the contact page on our website. So we'll start with some boxing and the potential GB boxing team for Paris 2024 is coming together. So let's just recap. We know that Charlie Davison, Rosie Eccles and Delicious Ori have all qualified courtesy of their performances at the European Games in Poland last year. Two further opportunities for the GB boxers to qualify for the Games. And the most recent one has just concluded. That is a qualification event in Italy. And as John said right at the start, two more British boxers have booked their place. Now, I should say they haven't been officially actually named by Team GB yet, but it would take something very serious for these boxers not to be going to the Games because they have qualified the weight division. So Patrick Brown and Chantel Reed have both qualified courtesy of their performances in Italy. It wasn't to be for Kieran McDonald and Owen Harris Allen, who both lost in their finals. They do, though, have another opportunity, a further event in May, which is going to be held in Bangkok in Thailand. There are another further eight weight classes that could be qualified so for the men flyweight featherweight light welterweight light middleweight and light heavyweight for the women light flyweight featherweight and lightweight classes still to be qualified so further opportunities for gb boxing we're expecting a team of around about 10 uh, to go to go to paris and following up the record-breaking performance for rob mccracken and his team in tokyo in 2021 yes we've got the famous five right now but we, we would expect more from GB Boxing for the team 
in Paris. And as you mentioned, these these amazing Olympic qualifiers, and we talked to UK Sport last week, and they're looking at uh, maybe bringing one to this country for the uh, the LA Games in, in 2028. And these Olympic qualifiers sound quite a new way of, of trying to talk about the Olympics when the Olympics isn't on. Yeah, I think they're a terrific idea, actually. I think boxing, obviously, a bit of a special case because of the situation in boxing with the governing body not being fit for purpose and therefore uh, the Olympics having to actually sort of take the the bull by the horns here, if you like, and actually create an event, something that the boxers can use to qualify. And that's what they've done here. But it is in the same way, I think, in football, where you have the kind of qualification, don't you, for the Euros or the World Cup, and it builds that expectation. And you know where you are in terms of qualification. I think probably the storytelling around people getting to the Olympics is not quite as clear cut as maybe football has it, in that these people get named but we don't really know how or why often, don't we? Unless you listen to this podcast (laughs) all the time. And I actually think with the creation of some of these Olympic qualification events that we've got in boxing, and they are obviously going to be doing in some of the urban sports as well, bringing together skateboarding and freestyle BMX and sport climbing and surfing and things like that. It does create that other little mini event. And also, I think from the point of view of a, a spectator or an Olympics follower, you also then get that excitement, that Mm. bit of jeopardy, don't you? Which is, I think, what sport is all about. It's a case now, when we look at that boxing tournament in May, it's last chance saloon for people. It's win or bust. It's go to the games or it's not go to the games. And I think that's a good thing. And it'd be great if Team GB, as you say, could confirm these athletes. Because, again, if you wait until there's 12 or 13, then there's less stories to be able to tell about everybody. And there's less media. You're you're compacting everybody into one kind of day. Here's the team announcement. Here's all these people. Here's what you need to know. Well, actually, we know that these five, as you say, unless something really badly happens, they get injured or whatever, these five are going to the games. So it would be great to get them confirmed, get that official letter uh, from Team GB and have them in the team and talking of knowing that some athletes will be going for team gb uh, someone who trains with gb boxing is also going to the games yep cindy and gamba who actually trains in sheffield at the institute of sport there with gb boxing in the gym with rob mccracken and all of the other gb boxers is awaiting british citizenship at the moment but has been selected to compete for the ioc refugee team now 59 places were on offer with more than 700 male and female boxers competing from around the world in this qualification event and cindy and gamba i think we'll probably adopt cindy as a kind of honorary member of Team GB when we do get to games time, but we'll be there and we'll be fighting on behalf of that refugee team, as I said. Talking of being there, a big thumbs up from the IOC on their final visit to Paris ahead of the Olympics, which, as I say, is about 140 days away now. The chair of the IOC Coordination Commission, Pierre Olivier Beckers Vujon, said, We are satisfied and we worked well together. Nothing is vague, everything is concrete was the uh, translation that uh, I was on when I was on the press conference last week, last Friday afternoon. But I tell you what, it seems the French are not quite a thumbs up. So the organisers are, the IOC are. There's a great article in The Guardian uh, in the last couple of days, uh, Michael, which is worth going and reading. And Julie, who's a 24-year-old support worker for refugees and lives in Paris, said, it feels a bit like covid Lockdown all over again. It's like saying, Parisians, stay confined to your homes, out of the way, while all this money is spent on the games. Personally, I'll be staying away. I'm not happy with the idea of clearing homeless people from the city to make way for the games. Now, that is a fair enough point of view, if that is the the point you have. I just remember it so much from London 2012. We had exactly the same issues. We're not going to like it. We don't want the Olympic lanes. Why are they allowed to drive on our roads? And we're not allowed to. The tube is going to be chaos. And then when the games began, they were absolutely incredible. And I remember being in Paris with a year to go and the cab driver who took me to uh, the Team GB camp at PSG was like, yep, I'm getting out of here. No one's going to be in Paris. And I think there are going to be some hotels that will be uh, maybe reducing their prices over the weeks to come. So if you've got tickets, it might be worth having a look. But there are many enthusiastic people as well. About 8 million tickets have been sold, 3 million uh, to the French, uh, 1.7 to people in the Paris regions as well. And the mayor of Paris, Anne Hildago, uh, said, please don't leave this summer. Don't leave. It would be idiocy. This is going to be incredible. You'd agree, wouldn't you, Michael? Yeah, I mean, the Olympic Games and we're clearly 
biased, but we're also <laughs> experienced, I would say. The Olympic Games has an ability to sprinkle a bit of magic stardust on a host city. And I don't think people kind of understand that until they get there. And people liken it to going to a music festival where you can just kind of indulge yourself and immerse yourself in music if that's your passion. And I think the Olympic Games does that, not just around sport, but just around national pride as well. And yeah, you're not going to please all the people all the time. We didn't please everybody in London no. when the Games were, were there in 2012. There were always going to be the naysayers. There's still people to me that say to me now it wasn't as good as we say it was. And <laughs> You know, those people are not going to be convinced. They're not going to have their viewpoint changed. And there will be people in Paris and the Olympic Games will be an inconvenience for them. The Olympic Games will get in the way. The Olympic Games might be putting a stop to their usual activities, their usual business, their usual place where they might go and eat and drink. And therefore, the Olympic Games will be an annoyance. But I do honestly believe in my experience of, of covering Olympic Games and being at Olympic Games that when it happens, when it starts... We have all these stories always in the build-up yeah. around tickets, around security, around transport, always. It's the Olympic build-up playbook that is underway at the minute. But I do believe that once it starts, people do get into it. And that's where the opening ceremony really does set a tone. It set the tone in London. You know, we've seen some plans for the opening ceremony for Paris, and we've seen some more plans in the last few days. Again, I think that will set the tone, and suddenly Parisian pride, national pride, will will kick in. And, you know, we talk, don't we, about the fact that in Rio, I can remember we were there about a week before the game started, mm -hmm. and we would walk into our media centre, and there was a small kind of favela, wasn't there, on yes. the way into, into the media centre. And then the day before the game started, we took our usual same route to the media centre, it was gone. Where people's homes had been 24 hours previously, they had disappeared. That's not right. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying I support it. It is, though, what happens at Olympic Games. It, it, will, it happened in London. It, it certainly happened in Rio. We saw it with our own eyes. And things like that will happen in, in Paris as well. And it will be the vendors and, you know, the, the other people that, that will maybe you know, feel the brunt of the Olympic Games more than others. But I, I do think, on the whole, the majority of people, once it happens, once it's underway, if it's going well, and I think you need a, a home nation to be doing well to help that as well. Mm -hmm. I think you need the organisation to be going well to, to help that. I do think the majority of people will look at it as a good thing. And it is also about the years afterwards that people come back and they, ha they have memories of watching Paris and they go, oh, let's go there. Not that... People wouldn't go to Paris anyway, but like the likes of Barcelona, that has become a place because so many people grew up in the 90s watching it on the television and go, oh, we'll go to Barcelona or whatever. So there is that kind of delayed legacy, if you like, from the Olympic Games as well. You mentioned the opening ceremony. Uh, Tony Astengue, the president of 2024, confirming that the opening ceremony on the River Seine will start at an earlier than normal time, 7.30 French time, so 6.30 here in the UK. He said we want to make the most of the natural light. I think also, Michael, what they're desperate to do is have as many athletes uh, take part as well, because my understanding is they will be on barges for many, many hours. Each team will have their own barge. And of course, you're sitting, you're standing, you're waiting around even more so than you would trying to get into a, a stadium, which is what we've seen in previous Olympics. So, for example, the British sailing team who are down in Marseille, I think are quite keen for their athletes maybe not to be going to the opening ceremony because by the time they're back in Marseille the following day, it's 4 or 5 a.m. before they come back. So I think that might have something to do with starting a bit earlier. So if you're an Olympic opening ceremony fan, which Michael is, get it in your diary a bit earlier because uh, it's going to be uh, slightly ahead of schedule and certainly if you're watching here in the UK. Also, no decision as whether any Russian or Belarusian athletes competing as individuals, of course, in the Olympics will be allowed to take part in the opening ceremony. Uh, Organisers said that the IOC executive board will have to make that decision. But overall, uh, Esten Gay said, we have the keys to the Olympic Village all the venues will be Olympicified over the coming months and there is excitement and anticipation right across France for the arrival of the Olympic flame in Marseille on May 8th. And we can't wait for that either. It's interesting, isn't it? They want a, a very much a daylight 
um, parade of athletes on the River Seine because Danny Boyle was very much um, of the opposite viewpoint. He thought, having reviewed all the previous opening ceremonies, that night time was the way to go. He mm. was he was absolutely adamant, wasn't he, uh, in all his press conferences in the build-up to the opening ceremony in London in 2012. It had to take place after dark, uh, which led to a bit of a continuity error, I always thought, with that sequence featuring the Queen because she took off from Buckingham Palace with James Bond in the, in the light. light. Yes but arrived at the stadium in the dark. I always thought that something had gone slightly awry there, but it seems that we're going to have mainly a daytime uh, or an early evening sort yeah. of uh, in terms of light uh, ceremony. And then it will all, of course, conclude at the Place de la Concorde, uh, where I think they are building a kind of temporary arena. And that's where all of the protocol and all the ceremony uh, will take place. I do have to say, though, if you're going to put me on a barge for three or four hours, I would quite like the sailing team to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> just well, in hey, case, hey, you know. Hey, for what, for what, my understanding, it really isn't happening. Um, I, I would just quite like to know that you know John Gibson and Anna Bennett are there. Just <laughs> if if something was to go wrong, but anyway, just, just um, that actually just reminded me of something, Michael. You talked about the London Games. Of course, London 2012 started at 12 minutes past eight. 2012. Um, they haven't got anything planned as yet. Is what we're told. I, I'm pretty sure they will at 2024, but. We asked the question. No, n nothing particularly planned for 8.24 in the evening. Well, of course, you'll know that I missed most of the opening ceremony of the London Games because I was covering Leeds United against Torquay in a pre-season <laughs> friendly game. that night. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to hockey. It doesn't rankle. <laughs> All these years on. Uh, Great Britain will start the men's Paris 2024 hockey tournament at 9am UK time. Their opening match will be against Spain on day one of competition because, of course, the opening ceremony is known as day zero. And the football and the rugby sevens that take place before that are known as days minus one and minus two. So day one for GB men, Saturday, July the 27th. We do have the full schedule. It's now out. GB women will face the same opponent, Spain, who beat them in qualifying earlier this year on day two. So that will be Sunday, 28th of July. South Africa on July the 28th for the British men, looking for their first medal since that famous gold in 1988. World number one's Netherlands next up on day four before the host France on day six. That is August the 1st and world number two Germany on day seven. Uh, the men's quarterfinals, if uh, Team GB get that far, Sunday the 4th of August with the gold and bronze medal matches on Thursday at 1pm or 6pm. And like the men, the British women are ranked sixth in the world currently. Uh, that's under the England flag because the home nations compete separately before coming together for the central programme. The Rio gold medalist, Tokyo and London bronze medalists start against Spain, as we've mentioned, 12-15. UK time. Uh, they play fourth in the world, Australia on day three, South Africa, United States, then uh, before finishing Paul B against the world number two. So that's Argentina. That will be Saturday, August the 3rd, day seven. And if Team GB's women reach the quarterfinals, the knockout stages Monday, August the 5th with the finals, the medal matches on the Friday. Well done. So, I mean, it's exciting to know what times they are. And again, people can start putting it in their diaries, can't they? Yeah, and I think that's the thing now with our Olympic planners is we will start being able to fill in things. We've got the football draw um, coming up very shortly mm. as well. And that is always the, the favourite thing, one of the favourite things for me um, about the Olympics. You know, my favourite thing is the, the smell of the venues and the noise from the helicopter of the overhead camera <laughs> just before the opening ceremony starts. But one of my other favourite things is when we get access to the big, the big website um, that you can get, yes. which lists every day and every competitor and every nation and every specific time as well. Then you can start really filling your planners in. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, other news from the games. Well, she didn't quite make it in surfing in the end. A rare misstep by Team GB's chef de mission, Mark England, who said that he thought that Sky Brown would be there in both sports, skateboarding and surfing. But Team GB's youngest ever medalist, Sky, will hope to be back at the Olympics in the sport that she won a medal in in Tokyo, a bronze medal. She's now 15. She's one of six British skateboarders confirmed to try and book a place in the Paris 2024 skateboarding park events. They're going to take place in the Place de la Concorde, on the banks of the River Seine, right in the centre of Paris. Now, the others will be 16-year-old Lily Strachan and 16-year-old Lola Tambling, 13-year-old Liverpool-born Tommy Calvert, alongside 14-year-old George O'Neill from Devon. So it seems that skateboarding is a young person's game, <laughs> although 50-year-old Andy McDonald 
And uh, James Hope Gill, who's the chief executive of GB Skateboarding, has been telling us about Andy McDonald for quite some time now. Uh, the 50-year-old will look to make up the uh, British squad. So they will be the uh, athletes trying to qualify in skateboarding to represent Team GB. There will be this Olympic qualifying series, Shanghai in May and Budapest in June. It's quite late, isn't it? feels yeah. late to be qualifying in May and June just to, for the Games. But as you say, these amazing Olympic qualifying events are very much urban. There'll be BMX freestyle there as well. So those are the six that are going to that for Great Britain. And hopefully, as you say, then being picked for Team GB. Now, talking of youngsters, 13-year-old Bly Twomey uh, took a massive leap towards qualification for the Paralympic Games by taking gold in the women's Class 7 singles at the Lingano Masters Para Open in Italy. The team from Brighton was ranked number one seed and she's also in action in Singapore this week. 32-year-old Aaron McKibben won gold in the men's class 8-2. So para table tennis continues its target for more places at the Paralympics. British modern pentathlon athlete Karenza Bryson won bronze in the Women's World Cup in Cairo. She started Olympic year uh, behind Hungary and Korea, who took first and second. But Bryson said afterwards that she was super happy with my performance. A, men a medal is what I wanted, so I achieved my target. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast. Stay with us. We'll hear from two of Britain's big hopes for medals come Paris this summer. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. This is Anything But Footy. We're en route to Paris 2024, counting down to the Olympic Games. And I always think it's interesting that we get the qualification series, then we get the team announced and we go and see all the athletes and uh, we talk to them about what it means to be part of Team GB. And then we kind of leave them alone, don't we? And the next time we, we catch up with most of the athletes who are named is probably in the week or two at the prep camp in yeah. the, the pre-competition kind of interviews that we do. So I thought it would be well worth checking in with one of those athletes who is named, who is going en route to Paris, will be on the Eurostar as Mark England continuously reminds us <laughs> well, is the way that Team GB are travelling uh, to the Games this year. And that is slalom canoeist Mallory Franklin, a medalist uh, from Tokyo. And I caught up with her just to find out how things have been going since she was officially named by Team GB. I think it's actually a really big advantage, especially in our sport, um, being able to spend as much time as possible at the Olympic venue and learning the course is a massive part of like us getting comfortable in the water and being able to perform when we get there. So I think getting selected early has really like allowed us to optimize that time and take the time to work out what's best for our training and have that focused attention and I guess settled everyone into the routine of who's going to the games and where the attention potentially more is at. And for you, does this one feel different? Because obviously we know the pandemic affected everyone and everyone involved in the build up to Tokyo. Does this feel in some ways more exciting? Yeah, I think it it does definitely feel different. Um I'm for sure more exciting, I think, with it being so close as well and having spent as much time on the venue and at Paris. Um, I think it's the main thing that makes it feel different. I, I don't think it really feels like I haven't noticed so much the difference of the other one having been, or Tokyo, <laughs> having been um, in COVID. Um, like I haven't, I, I haven't necessarily had a massive difference in that per se, but I think being able to spend the time at Paris and being able to just pop over there and get comfortable in the environment and spend the time on the course, I think makes it feel way more exciting because it's you get to really imagine what it's going to be like with all the fans and all of those elements that um, is really daunting but also really exciting and I'm really happy to have been able to settle myself in that environment before then it being the crazy circus that it's going to be I'm sure. And as the phone buzz more with family and friends talking tickets and talking Euro stars and all the rest of it? Uh, a little bit more. Um, I'm probably one of the athletes that has slightly less, um, well, slightly less family full stop, but definitely less family that's going to come across. Um, but that's kind of OK. I think there's there's definitely bits and I like I probably hear it more across the team and, and the other 
um canoe asylum athletes generally have more family and there's a lot more chat um with them but I think the ability to get involved and my friends that do have tickets and my family that do have tickets so definitely I think building is that excitement of planning it all and working out how it's going to be and everything that goes with it that I think is like a really nice touch that I guess yeah we lost in Tokyo and it didn't really exist when you came back with your medal from Tokyo was it always very much in your mind that you were going to go again and Paris and and a gold medal certainly still an ambition yeah 100% um I think getting that medal in Tokyo was was always somewhat just a stepping stone for me and in trying to perform the best I can and get the most out of myself um I think that there was always that part of me that had the flame still there for kayak as well which obviously isn't happening this time around either but um trying to really keep my kayak involved and keep the dream of going in kayak too um although that's probably a little bit more gone now but um I think that getting a medal at an event like that and and being and knowing what it's like I think only drives even more to try and be back in that environment and hopefully take a step to the left and be that little bit higher um but and it's cool now, like I've got two different disciplines to try and do it in. And there's definitely that drive in both and kind of looking forward to seeing what happens across the whole team. We've got a really strong team and I think there's real scope to be seeing British athletes on that podium multiple times. Mallory Franklin. So we know Mallory will be there. But what about Gemma Riki, the Scottish 800 metre star won silver on the final night of the World Indoor Athletics Championships in Glasgow, a competition that has kicked off a big year in style for world athletics. The World Cross Country takes place at the end of this month in Belgrade before the European Championships in Rome and, of course, the Olympics in the Stade de France in Paris. Now, we know that British athletics won't be naming their team for a while, unlike British canoeing, as we've already heard. But Michael caught up with Gemma in Glasgow after her medal to look ahead to the rest of 2024. Probably not as buzzing as it should be, and I think once I speak to my coach, I'll feel a bit better, but I made some big mistakes there, but some lessons learned, and I should be really happy with a silver at the World of <laughs> And I've interviewed enough track and field athletes to know that we talk about things like processes and yeah. learnings, and that's yeah. what you're taking from tonight and this meet? Yeah, some big learnings. The girls threw hard cards at me, and I knew they would, because I wanted to make it as hard as they could to beat me on my home track, but yeah, I should be happy with the silver medal today and do you think when you kind of get home and reflect 24 48 hours time you're going to think look second in the world it's not too shabby yeah definitely but I'm also thinking I've got a lot of work to do before that Olympic Games so yeah but I'm in the right way I'm going the right way this time last year I couldn't even do indoors I wasn't healthy or mentally good enough to be able to run indoors so I should take away today with the silver medal (laughs) is tomorrow the day you circle the Olympic final on your calendar or has it always just been in the thoughts even through this indoor season yeah it's always been on the thoughts yeah it's always been in the thoughts and it's always been towards that summer towards that summer and this was a good break to break up training and just get a feel and get some practice at racing as well so let's turn our attention to Paris now. What happens next for you? Where do you go? Do you get any time off between now or is it just back to work in the morning? I've got a bit of a down week. I'll keep running, but it's my birthday this week. I've got some exciting things this week coming up. and um, So I'll have a bit of a down week, but then it's all eyes on Paris. What are you doing for your birthday? Um, I'm actually just having my little cousins around, my grandpa and just my close family because I've spent two months away from home and I've not used to that. This is the first time that I've been doing it and I said to my mum for my birthday this year, all I want is my closest family around me on my birthday. So. What do you want as a present? Because you've delivered a present <laughs> that they're going to want their pictures with. <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't need any presents. I just want to spend some time with my family and that'll be the best. Well, lovely chatting Thank as ever. You. Cheers, Thank you. Thank you. It's a really interesting story, I think, with Gemma Riki because I think she's been in the shadow of Keely Hodgkinson and, mm. and to a greater or lesser extent, Laura Muir as well in terms of sort of British middle distance running. Um, we know that she's completely changed her setup in the last year, as has Laura Muir as well with a new coach. And it seems to be really paying off. She seemed... And I spoke to her at the British Championships and then spoke to her again after the, the medal at the World Indoor Championships as well. She seems very happy, very confident in her own skin. And, you know, I think we talked, didn't we, about the importance of the indoors for some athletes. And, and not all athletes want to include the indoors as part of their season. But I think for someone like Gemma, just to get on that podium to win that silver medal on that final night is an important breakthrough. And we mm. saw it with Katarina Johnson-Thompson. We saw, saw it with Laura Muir as well. Just getting the, the global medal or the 
Continental Medal indoors just gives you that little bit of a lift. Knows It just means you, that you know that you can mix it with the very best in the world. And I think that could be a really, really important landmark run, that silver medal en route to, to Paris and what Gemma Ricci will hope to achieve at the Olympic Games. I liked it as well where she said to you, I'm, I've got to learn from this. I'm, I'm disappointed. But I would say to her as well, yeah. that was your best ever result. You've got a world medal. You've got a silver medal. It's the best result that you've ever had in your career. So enjoy some of it as well. And I know you spoke to her literally straight after the race. It's quite difficult to kind of put that in perspective. She wanted a gold. It was only a silver. But it's a stepping stone. And as you say, she's, yeah. she's got a new coach. She's le- she's doing new things all the time with a, with a new coach. Even though you go through the same set, set up, the same anniversary, the same schedule, the same calendar. But actually you're doing something new every time. And I think that is a real benefit. And we've seen that from, from Gemma's performance. And I think just lo- looking back on with Mallory as well, she's obviously in a totally different position from Gemma. She knows she's going. And it's just maintaining that level, isn't it? Where, where you're at and and I think the I think the European canoe slalom championships are before the worlds so do you go all out for that or do you just use it as part of your training I think you probably as far as the, the British canoe slalom team are concerned I think you use it as mm. part of the process don't you because yeah. ultimately I think in a sport like canoe slalom and it, it's a really good sport it's, it's really entertaining it it's really easy to follow as well I mean it's I think for uh, someone of our generation of course we, we're used to sort of seeing canoe slalom because of tv programs back in the day uh, that used to feature canoe slalom it Was is it also I, up? paddles up was the, was the one I was thinking yeah. about um, and and I think what I like about the way that canoe slalom is, obviously you have the kind of qualifying runs and then you'll have the final where you'll have maybe eight, 10, whatever number of athletes. And then you've, you've basically got a power hour, haven't you? And at the end of it, you know who's won a bronze, who's won a silver and who's won a gold. Yeah. And I think when you look at the Olympics from the outside, it, it's essentially a television format for most people. Most people will not be at the Olympic Games. Most people will not be at canoe slalom. But for that morning of the games, it will provide, and it's not just Mallory, of course, it's the other three that have been named as well, including Joe Clark and a, an Olympic gold medalist from Rio and Kimberly Woods, of yep. course, and Adam Burgess as well. They've all got great chances. And I just think you it's just one of those sports that for that hour or so, you will really, really get invested in mm. and you will listen to what the reporters and the commentators are saying and you will begin to learn a bit more about the discipline. And that's what I think we try and harness, don't we, in the, the rest of the cycle outside of the Olympic Games. So to go back to the, the, the point, yeah, European Championships, World Championships, important. And obviously, you know, let's not do down uh, the opportunity to win a continental or a global medal. But for these guys, it will be where the Olympics, I think, where they are judged. Absolutely. Staying with athletics, as we were talking about Gemma Riki, there's some news ahead of the London Marathon in April. The leading Brit from last year, 2023, Emil Keres returns, while Mark Scott makes his London debut at 26.2 miles. Uh, the TCS New York City Marathon champion, Tamarit Tola, headlines the men's field, while world record holder Tis Asefa leads the charge to break the women's only world record of 2.17.01. Other names to look out for include Bridget Koskai, and also Perez Shepshersh at the Olympic champion. Mm, looking forward to London Marathon. It's always a, uh, you know, summer's nearly here when the marathon is on the streets of London. Don't forget to check out Anything But Footy on social media. You can find us on all the platforms, on Facebook, on Insta, on Threads. Uh, we've even got some TikToks out there, and I might have missed one. Uh, but you can definitely find us there. <laughs> you can also read our latest blogs and see our 2024 sporting calendar. As John said there, I love the uh, spring, sporting, summer uh, months in the UK. And that is all there on the website, anythingbutfooty.com. And do stay with us as we count down to Paris 2024, the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.